Amen. Well, I want to start our new series today called Unstoppable. And this series is specifically designed to talk about and teach us what the church is, how it relates to God's program and plan for redeeming the world. Now, today I specifically want to talk about the big picture because there's so much misinformation about what the church is. And this series is going to help us understand not so much about what Hope Cathedral is with a, a little C church, but what the big C church, the universal church of the Lord Jesus Christ is all about. I want us to have a context to understand that when someone says church, here is the biblical understanding and definition. We've seen over the last uh, year and a half with everything that's gone on with, with uh, the, the, the pandemic, we've seen people redefine what church means. And there are people who are saying that I can be a Christian, but yet I don't have to go to church. That I can somehow live for Jesus, but be disconnected from the institution called church that God himself founded. And I want to just show you from scripture that that is not biblically accurate. That I cannot say I am a Christian and not come to church, not be a part of a local assembly. In the same way, I, can, I can't say I'm a husband and be married and never come home. I need you to hear me today. Does being a part of a church mean you're a Christian? No. But if you're a Christian, you should be a part of a local church. Amen. So we're going to break this down and we're going to look at all of this. But, but first, I want us to look at the big picture of what the church is and why it's important to God. And here's the, the first truth I want us to understand, and that is simply this. The local church is the hope of the world. The local church is the hope of the world. And I want you to keep that in, in mind as I teach, because that's going to be what backs up and what reinforces everything that happens. Because if we understand fully what the church is and how we play a role in, in the church and in God's greater plan to reach the world, then we understand that church is not optional and church is not extraneous. It's not extra, but church is essential to the life of the believer and to the transformation of society. So when Jesus was with his disciples, he did a pulse check, as it were, to to ask them, what are people saying about me? Who, who am I? How do people see me? That was his, his fundamental question that he asked his disciples. So I want to turn our attention to Matthew chapter 16 this morning. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And that same misunderstanding exists today. Some people say Jesus is a, is a good man. He is a prophet. Some say he's just a guy upstairs. Some people say he's just a figment of our imagination. There was no historical figure named Jesus. The same misconceptions and misperceptions of who Jesus is still exist today. But then Jesus goes a little closer and says to them, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter, he answered and said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. Notice. Simon gives the right answer. You are the Messiah, the Savior. You are the Son of the living God. And Jesus says you are blessed for coming up with that, for, for having that understanding, for coming to that conclusion. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And all the powers of hell will not conquer it. So notice, Peter gets 
right who Jesus is. You are Messiah. You are the Savior. You are the Son of the living God. Jesus says, Peter, you're blessed because you didn't get this from human knowledge. My Father revealed that to you. So upon this rock, Peter, I will build my church. The foundation of the church is this understanding of who Jesus is. That he is the Savior. That he is the Son of the living God. And then Jesus closes this this, uh, section out by saying, and I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So when you know properly who Jesus is, and his church is founded upon that revelation, we now have power. I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. There is an earth-heaven connection that the church represents. And we miss this when we think that we can just serve God and never be a part of God's church. Because it, this is the place, and I'm going to talk about this next week, where God designed that heaven and earth meet. Mm. That's why there's something special that happens when we corporately worship together that does not happen in your home. There's something unique that God does in our midst as believers in his church that is different from what you do when you're in your car, what you do when you're at your desk. Because God said through Jesus that when you understand this revelation, and that's what the church is built upon, now you have the ability to permit things to happen and forbid things to happen, not because of who you are, but because of what you're connected to. The gates of hell can't conquer the church. So if the gates of hell can't conquer the church, if I'm not connected to the church then I am not unstoppable. In this world you will have trouble, Jesus said. But be of good cheer because I, Jesus said, have overcome the world. So do you, understand, do you overcome trouble because of who you are? No, you overcome trouble because of who he is. And his church is the connector that causes me, along with other believers, to be in the the ark of God's safety, God's protection, God's provision, and God's power. There was never a scenario in the early church where someone would say, I follow Jesus, but I want to have nothing to do with the church. There was no scenario like that because they knew that their identity in Christ was derived from being in Christ, which meant being a part of his physical body on the earth, which is the church. So let me give you these points. Point number one, the church is founded on Jesus. And it's not just Jesus as a name, but understanding who he is. Jesus is Messiah. He is the promised one. He is the anointed one. He is the Savior. And he is the Son of the living God. That's the revelation that we carry as a church. That is the message of the church that we let people know that Jesus was not just a holy man. He was not just a good teacher. He was not just a prophet. He was not just a healer. He is the promised one, the anointed one, the savior of the world. He is the very son of the living God. And there is no other religion on the face of this earth that makes that claim 
outside of Christianity. So the church is founded on who Jesus is and what he came to do. So what did Jesus do? Well, Jesus preached the good news of the kingdom. When Jesus came, he didn't preach the church, the church, the church. This is where people take uh, Jesus' lack of mentioning the church to somehow suggest that you can be a Christian but not be a part of the church. But I'm going to show you that, that the church is integral to God's establishment of how he wants his kingdom to operate on the earth. So when Jesus came, he came preaching the kingdom of God, the good news of the kingdom of God. That's what he came to preach. Look at this in Mark chapter 1. I want you to see this. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. Gospel means the good news, the message. And here's what he said. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. That's the message that Jesus brought. That God's kingdom is now coming into the earth. God's kingdom is invading the earth. And since it's coming, your response is not to fight it, not to try to resist it. Your response is to repent, change your mind, change the way you think, change the way you live, and believe in the gospel, the good news. What is the good news? The good news is that Jesus is here. And Jesus loves you. And Jesus, God is not mad at you. The good news is there's a place for you in God's family. You don't have to let sin rule your life anymore. You are loved by an everlasting God. That's the good news. Jesus lived that out each and every day. So when we talk about what the church is about, the church is about Jesus and advancing the message that he preached, which is the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, this is a powerful message, and of course, Jesus is the son of God, so he could pretty much do it on his own, couldn't he? I mean, he's the son of God, he's the savior, he's the anointed one, he's the Messiah. So he could just do whatever he wants to do because he's the son of God. But Jesus in his plan did not go about preaching by himself. He enlisted others to follow him. Write this point down on your note sheet. Jesus recruited followers to help him. Now, he's the son of God. He is, the very, he is God himself on earth. He didn't need any help, but he chose to include us. In the larger plan, I need us to understand this. We have a role to play in advancing the kingdom of God. So Jesus recruited people to help him. The Bible calls them disciples, students, because they had to be taught before they could go out and fulfill the, the commission of the church. So here's what Jesus said, say, that same Mark chapter 1. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And look what happens. These were people who had professions, who had busy lives, who had things going on. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Jesus went to these fishermen who were skilled at, at catching fish, and it was necessary because around the Sea of Galilee, that was the main staple that people ate when they, ate, when they wanted some kind of uh, protein. They got fish. So these fishermen were skilled at how to catch fish. And Jesus says to them, in the same way you're skilled at catching fish, I want to train you how to catch fish. Men, not for uh, the sustenance of a community, but for the salvation of the world. I want you to become fishers of men. That's what he called us who are followers of Jesus to do. That's why we can't just be in church and just sit and be glad we're a part of church. That, that violates the purpose for which God brought us into his kingdom. 
He's recruiting us to help expand his kingdom. And so much so that I want you to see what happened with a, with a man named Paul. We've, we've talked about him. He's the, the one who wrote the majority of the New Testament. But here's what Paul says. Paul says, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried, he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. So notice, Jesus calls people to follow him. To, he recruits people to share in the message of the kingdom of God, to share the good news. Paul, who comes along a little bit later, he's transformed and starts preaching the good news. And then Paul reminds believers in Corinth that this is the essential message that you cannot get wrong, that Jesus lived, that he died for our sins. And later in another book, he talks about how Jesus is coming back again. That's the message. And I want to ask you now, and you're going to hear me go back to this every time we're in this series. What are you doing to fulfill your responsibility in the kingdom of God? Who are you sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with? Paul says, I, I passed on to you that which was most important. What was most important is not my political affiliation. What's most important is not whether I'm conservative or liberal. What's most important is not my race, not my money, not my education. What's most important is not the favorite restaurant I go to. What's most important is not the, 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 the nice movie that I've seen recently. What's most important is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, you may use all those other things to get a door to talk about the gospel, but if you end with talking about your favorite restaurant, your favorite store, your favorite this, your favorite that, and you never point someone to the Savior, you've missed an opportunity. Church, I need you to hear us. You want to see this world get better? This world gets better by the followers of Jesus Christ sharing the hope that comes from the good news. We can protest all we want. That's not going to change hearts. What changes hearts is Jesus. That's how you got here. If I were to give you a mic and let you tell your story and how far away from God you were, but look what God has done in your life. And he wants to do the same thing in somebody else's life. But he can't do it if you remain silent. And could it be that there's someone who's actually standing out there who needs to hear your story? Yeah. And in hearing your story, they will say, wow. I didn't know Jesus could do all of that. But if he can do it for you, then I want him to do it for me. Are you all hearing me today? So when Jesus recruited us, he actually uh, assigned us a specific role. And that role is called an ambassador. You don't really hear us talk about that much, but you are, you are a Christian, of course. But I would almost say you should remember that you are also an ambassador for Christ. An ambassador for Christ. Which means you are sent by Christ to fulfill his purposes. Let me show this to you in scripture. Look at, look at the, the screen for this. Paul, once again, is talking about our relationship to, what, to, 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 to the new life, to, transfer, to a transformed life, to being new creatures, to actually representing what it means to, be, to have a B.C. before Christ and an A.D. and after Christ life. And then here's what Paul says. Once you've been transformed, God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. 
And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. That's the message. The message of the church is you don't have to live in your sin anymore, that you have a place in God's family. God opens his arms for you to come in so that you can be transformed and be made new like a new creature. And that's what God desires for all of us. He's not counting your sins against you, but he's letting you know you don't have to die in your sin. There's hope if you will just come to God. That's the wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. That's who we are. Let that sink in. How can Jesus touch the world and transform lives today? Through us. You pray, God, I I want you to do a work on my job. And I believe what God responds is, that's why I put you there. God, I want you to do a work in my family. I know. That's why I put you there. God, I want my my community to be better. I do too. Why do you think I sent you there? We are the ambassadors. We are the ones who God has sent to share the message of reconciliation with the world. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. That's the message. Come back to God. Come back to God. I never knew who God was. I never followed him. Yeah, you, you, you do because you wouldn't be here without him. And so God wants you to come back to him, the one who created you, the one who knew you when you were in your mother's womb. Come back to him. Give him a chance. You've tried everything else. Give him a chance. If he can change my life, then I know he can change yours too. So we can't complete God's mission apart from Jesus and his church. And if we're going to be unstoppable and we're going to make a difference in our generation, it's going to require the church, the big C church, all churches open in the name of Jesus to fulfill their calling to be ambassadors for Christ. Because the church, point number two, advances the kingdom of God. The role of the church is to advance the kingdom that Jesus preached about. Look at Psalm 103. I want you to see this. This, this, this idea of a kingdom is not a new, just a New Testament concept. Look at what, what, Paul, uh, what David says, rather, in Psalm 103. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, look at this, and his kingdom rules over all. Oh, come on, church. Rules over all. Rules over all. So we're a part, not of an inferior kingdom. We're a part of a kingdom that rules over all. All. There is no kingdom greater than the kingdom of our God. And Jesus then said in John chapter 18, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus said that he's a part of something not that humans created. He is an extension of the kingdom of God. And that kingdom is invading the earth, not by the world standards or the or earth standards or human standards. That kingdom is coming, bringing a new reality, how to operate, how to function. The world operates with manipulation. The church operates by love. The world operates by pressure and all these other things. The, word of the, the Bible that, uh, teaches us that the church operates by the spirit of God. We have to understand that we're a part of something that operates differently than the world. Jesus preached the kingdom of God, also sometimes called the kingdom of heaven. It is the rule that is established by God. And that rule and reign of God has to leave heaven and come down here on earth. And the church is the visible symbol that the kingdom of God is alive and well. It breaks my heart when I drive through communities and see churches boarded up, churches that are abandoned, Because that church once stood as 
an emissary for the kingdom of God. And we're seeing churches close in a rapid number over the last year and a half, seeing pastors, oh, thousands of pastors every month quit. And churches are left without pastors and some ultimately close down. The only one that wins when the church is closed is the devil. Because I don't care how many churches there are, we need more. We need more. Because the church is the only institution, look at this, ordained by God to change the world. Let that sink in. The church is the only institution ordained by God to change the world. Well, but yeah, but, but God instituted the family. He certainly did. But he never instituted the family to change the world. He instituted the family as a representation of who he is, and families make up the church, but it is the church as an institution that brings about change. There used to be a, a mindset of every church that its desire was to serve its community and to show the kingdom of God in that community. That's why there were community churches. Because the church has to be the visible sign of the kingdom of God. That's how we change this world. That's why this church is actively involved in helping to plant other churches. Because people need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ in a way that they can receive it. And we can't do that as one church alone. We need all the churches we can get that are holding up the banner of Jesus Christ to work together to transform this society. How does society change? By the church fulfilling its mission and purpose in the earth. That's how the world changes. And if we understand that, we'll redouble our commitments. Let me give you this definition for the church, and we're going to be done for today. The church is the body of Christ followers advancing the kingdom of God on the earth. And when you get connected to the church through salvation, through acknowledging who Jesus is, you become a part of something that is unstoppable. We used to sing this, this song, this is the Lord's church and Jesus is Lord. Some of my, my veterans know this. This is the church that's been established on his word. This is the church that the Lord is building. The gates of hell shall not prevail. This is the Lord's church and Jesus is Lord. That is the confession that drives the church and we're to take the message of God's reconciling love to a broken world and let them know God's not mad at you. God wants to show you what it really means to live a full life, live an abundant life. That's what Jesus died for us to have. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Jesus loves you, and he wants to see your life become everything God intended for it to be. But you'll never know what that is until you surrender your life to him. When Jesus says, repent and believe the gospel, what he's saying is, I want you to take a moment and actually recognize that the way you, you've tried to do it doesn't work. And I want you to make a U-turn. That's what God wants you to do. He wants you to make a U-turn and come back to the God who created you. So today I want to give you an opportunity. I want to make two appeals this morning. The first is for those who have never committed their lives to Jesus. God loves you and God wants you in his family. God wants to give you a second chance, a third chance, a fifth chance at life. And I want to pray for you. But I also want to pray for those who recognize that the way they've been living their Christian lives is not pleasing to the God who loves them. And so for some of you, you need to rededicate your life to Christ. And we want to give you an opportunity to do that today. 
And so if you're here, you would say, Trevon, that's me. I need you to pray for me because I need to give my heart to Jesus or because I need to recommit my life to Jesus. I want to pray for you. All I want to ask you to do is just raise your hand as an act of faith to say, please include me in the prayer. I see your hand. Are there others who would say, pray for me? I see your hand. Say, those of you who would say, even online, hey, listen, I, I, I've not fulfilled what God has put me on this earth to do. I've been a comfortable Christian, and I recognize that I'm not doing everything that Jesus called me to do. I need to rededicate my life to Christ. Click that hand raise button, and that lets me know that you've been included in this prayer. Now I'm going to ask all of you to pray this prayer with me. Say, my father. Come on, say it like you mean it. Say, my father. I know without Jesus I'm lost. I believe Jesus died for me. And everything I've done wrong is forgiven. I believe Jesus is alive. And I make him the leader of my life. Father, fill me with your spirit. And show me your plan for my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God thanks for that.